Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Al Khan Foundation Pakistan to this event. I'm delighted that Ms. Karen Armstrong has accepted the invitation to come to Pakistan to speak on a subject that has, for the past few years, been under discussion worldwide with renewed interest. Today's lecture is a first in a series of lectures which have been organized by the Al Khan Development Network to commemorate the Golden Jubilee of His Highness Prince Karim Al Khan, the Imam and spiritual leader of the Shia Imami Ismaili Muslims. His Highness the Al Khan marked the 50th anniversary of his accession to the Ismaili Imamat on 11th of July 2007. He succeeded his grandfather, Sir Sultan Muhammad Al Shah Al Khan, as the 49th Hereditary Imam. Like his grandfather, before him, His Highness Prince Karim Al Khan has, since assuming the office of Imamat, been concerned with the well being of all Muslims, particularly in the face of challenges of rapid historical changes. Today, the Al Khan Development Network works in some 25 countries, mainly in West and Central Asia, Africa, Middle East, as well as in North America and Western Europe. The Golden Jubilee is a celebration that commemorates the milestone of 50 years of the Imamat of His Highness the Al Khan. In the Ismaili tradition, the Imam's Jubilee celebration offers occasion to launch new social, cultural, and economic development projects. In keeping with the ethics of the faith, these projects aspire to improve the quality of life in, of the most vulnerable in society. The Al Khan Development Network is a contemporary endeavor of the Ismaili Imamat to realize the social conscience of Islam through institutional action. The network brings together a number of agencies, institutions, and programs that have been built up over the past 40 years and are aimed at improving the living conditions and opportunities in specific regions of the developing world. The Al Khan Foundation is a part of the Al Khan Development Network. It was established in Pakistan in 1969, and it primarily works in the areas of education, health, rural development, civil society, and environment. While each agency pursues its own mandate, all of them work together with the overarching framework of the Al Khan Development Network so that their different pursuits can interact and reinforce one another. Their common goal is to help the poor achieve a level of self-reliance whereby they are able to plan their own livelihood and help those even more needy than themselves. It is the belief of the Archan Development Network that for achieving such self-reliance, it is essential to have a strong and healthy civil society and to instill and encourage pluralism, an aspect which will be explored in today's lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I would like to warmly welcome you and hope that you will find today's lecture stimulating and enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vellani. I would now like to request Mr. Amin Hashwani, convener, Golden Jubilee National Events Task Force, His Highness the Al Khan, Ismaili Council for Pakistan, to introduce and invite our guest speaker for today's address. In the last century, 160 million people died due to conflicts as population grew from three to six billion. This century has also started on a turbulent note and the global population is expected to grow from six to nine billion people by the, by the year 2050, potentially enhancing the scale of confrontation. We are today embroiled in debates about these conflicts. What are the root causes versus the final effects? What are the truths versus the perceptions? What are the myths versus the, rea the realities? On this note, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest here today, Ms. Karen Armstrong. She has written books on nearly all the great traditions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, 
Buddhism, and other Oriental faiths. Ms. Armstrong has been chiefly known for her work on Islam, especially after 9-11, and has addressed members of the US Congress, Senate, and, and spoken at the State Department and the CIA. She was also a member of the high-level group in the United Nations initiative, the Alliance of Civilization. Invited by Kofi Annan to dialogue on the causes of extremism and give practical guidelines to member states. Her aim is to promote peace, respect, and mutual understanding. With this, I'd like to invite Ms. Cannon Armstrong. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be back in Pakistan, and I'm most grateful to the Ismaili community for arranging this tour and inviting me uh, to share with you my thoughts at this very, very difficult juncture of our common history. Um, Allah is the light of the world, we've just heard, uh, neither of the East nor the West. The, a light which cannot be confined to any single lamp uh, which uh, spreads throughout the world. The wonderful pluralism of the Quran, the continuous outreach of the Quran. I remember this was one of the things that first attracted me to the religion of Islam. Uh, some, uh, I, I shudder to think how many years ago it was now. Uh, when I went to Jerusalem to make a television series. Um, and I'd never really thought about Islam at all until that time. Um, but when you're in the holy city and you see uh, the three religions of Abraham jostling often uneasily at the same sacred sites, you become aware not only of the conflict that has existed between them all, but also of the great similarities. And after that time, I started to try to promote what I called triple vision, where one saw the three, these three faiths as a single tradition in the way that the Quran does, but that has gone in three different directions. Um, and I, at that time, was very hostile to religion. I had uh, had a, a difficult uh, Christian experience as a young girl in my convent and for 13 years I wanted nothing to do with religion ever again. Um, not only had I no intention whatever of being a writer of, of religious books, I couldn't even bear to s read one of them, um, but it was the study of other traditions uh, notably Islam, that brought me back to a sense of what religion could be at its best. You always, in religious, uh, when speaking about religion, you always have to add those uh, three little words, at its best, because religion is, like any human activity, uh, something that can get messed up. We have a wonderful talent, we human beings, for spoiling something good. But one of the things that actually appealed to me enormously um, about Islam was this pluralism. After my very narrow uh, ca Roman Catholic upbringing, where we didn't even think Christian Protestants were really uh, qualified as religious uh, at all, never mind people of other faiths, uh, this outreach that I, I found in the Quran and particularly in the Sufi tradition uh, was enormously inspiring to me and, and gave me a whole new perspective on how to be religious. So what happened? Uh, why is it that uh, so often in the West, and, I, and it is true, uh, that Islam is presented as a, uh, an inherently violent faith uh, that established itself by the sword? How is it that we're talking about a clash of civilizations? Well, I'm a historian, and I like, uh, I always think it's a help to look back on and see how these things uh, came to being. Then you get into a, a perspective 
on the present, which I think can help us. Um, it certainly, uh, where there was no uh, revulsion from the Islamic world when it first encountered the modernized West. Um, people were surprised because hitherto, as I shall explain, uh, Europe had been a rather backward region, uh, long, way behind the other great uh, 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 civilizations. But it had done a massive catch-up and was suddenly coming out with a different kind of civilization. And at the turn of the 20th century, it's now very poignant to recall that nearly every single leading Muslim intellectual, with one exception that I can think of, perhaps some of you can think of more, was in love with the West and wanted their countries to look just like Britain and France. They seemed to recognize it as deeply congenial to their own traditions. There's a famous story about Muhammad Abdu. Uh, the uh, Grand Mufti of Egypt at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, Abdu was hated the British occupation of his country, but he was very much at home in European culture, uh, very much at home with Europeans. And once, famously and no doubt provocatively, after a trip to Paris, he came back and said, in France, I saw Islam, but no Muslims. In Egypt, I see Muslims, but no Islam. And what he was saying in this provocative way was that in their modernized societies, uh, in, in their newly developed economies, uh, the Western, the Europeans, at that time, the United States wasn't quite in the radar screen, but Britain and France, uh, were able to introduce the kind of equality that the Quran speaks of, a fairer society, uh, that was greater than the potential of the unmodernized or partially modernized countries. Similarly, at about the same time, in 1906 in Iran, uh, leading mullahs campaigned alongside secularist intellectuals uh, for constitutional rule uh, and democratic government, a parliament. And they got their parliament, but uh, it was never really allowed to function fully until uh, the, the Islamic Revolution uh, of 1978-79, because uh, just afterwards, unfortunately, the British discovered oil in Iran and they weren't going to allow uh, any kind of Iranian parliament to scupper their plans for oil, which they used to fuel the British Navy. But at the time that the Constitution was first promulgated, um, the grand ayat one of the Grand Ayatollahs in Najaf said that the new Constitution was the next best thing to the coming of the hidden Imam, because it would um, limit the tyranny of the Shahs. And that made it a project sacred to every Shiite for every, for every Muslim. And of course, it's poignant to think back on those happy times. Uh, and what, what went wrong? Well, the short answer to that, I think, was probably Western foreign policy. Um, the, 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 the whole aftermath of World War I, the invasion of the Middle East in the 1920s by the splitting up uh, into new mandates uh, in, 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 in after the 1920s, Suez Crisis, Israel-Palestine, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, but so the problem we have is political. Uh, I add this when I was with the Alliance of Civilizations, was what we all agreed in the high-level group, 20 of us from all around the world, that there wasn't, it was not religiously called, uh, uh, in, uh, inspired, uh, but is primarily a response to an imbalance of power in the world, uh, with too little, too much power invested with too few people, um, and with questions of modernity, which I'll come to in a moment. 
A lot of our problems come from the concept of modernity uh, and uh, the difficulties of modernization. And I'll be exploring that in a moment. Now, having seen the positive, uh, initially positive way in which the Muslims uh, greeted the modern West, um, it's rather sad for me to have to tell you that there was not such a positive view on the other side. Uh, at the time of the Crusades, uh, 11th or 12th century, uh, Europe, Western Europe, found its soul. For 800 years, it had existed in a state of barbarism. Uh, Christianity was virtually dead. Most of the people were pagan uh, uh, with, a, with an admixture, strange admixture of Christian ideas. After the collapse of the Roman Empire, civilization plummeted in that, in that region. Um, and it was at the time of the Crusades uh, when the Cluniac monks and the popes pulled Europe together and started educating them in the Christian life. The first cooperative act of this new Europe uh, was a crusade. Uh, a, un a united crusade to stop the monk, the soldiers and barons of Europe from fighting each other. The Pope says, go and get the Holy Land back, uh, the Holy Tomb of Christ back from the Saracens. We'll have holy peace at home and holy war abroad. Now, um, at this time, um, basically, um, Western people knew virtually nothing about Islam. Uh, not, very little at all. They didn't know much about anything, really. Uh, but when they did encounter it, what they found was, an, uh, of course, a culture that was far more advanced, uh, far more sophisticated, and perhaps not uh, unlike the United States today, a major world power. And they resented it. They also resented the Byzantine Greeks and uh, also hated uh, the Jewish uh, population in their midst. Uh, we have been intolerant. It is true of us that we are intolerant people. Um, and um, at that time, Islam became, as it were, the shadow self of Europe. Um, we like to project onto Islam our buried worries about our own behavior. For example, crusading. Uh, Jesus had told his followers to love their enemies, not to exterminate them. Um, and there was obviously, so at some levels, a, a lot of denial going on that this could possibly be a Christian holy war. And it is at this time, that in the 12th century, that the scholar monks of Europe began to write about Islam as a violent religion of the sword, um, projecting uh, their own misdoings onto the enemy, which they'd kind of created as a distorted mirror image of themselves in their own image and likeness. At this time too, the popes were trying hard to impose celibacy on the extremely reluctant clergy. The clergy managed to fight this off. Uh, there were married priests in Europe until the 13th century when the popes finally made this stick. Um, and with perhaps a good deal of ill-concealed envy, these scholar monks wrote uh, very lubriciously, I'm sorry to say, about uh, the prophet's life and his many wives. Um, at a time when Europe was very, very feudal with uh, the pope at the top and layers of uh, ranks of hierarchies going down until you've got the common people at the bottom of the triangle, uh, the Europeans blamed Islam for giving people like women and slaves too much equality. Uh, there was a tendency uh, to, to project our buried worries onto uh, the Muslims. And we did exactly the same with the Jewish people in our midst. Uh, at that time, anti-Semitism, hatred of Jew Jewishness became a chronic disease in Europe. Now, uh, that shadow self has pertained. It's one of the received ideas lurking around the Western unconscious. And it became very apparent to me uh, at the time of Salman Rushdie's uh, Satanic Verses. When that book was published, um, I had started to learn about Islam. And I knew that this was not an accurate portrayal of the Prophet's life, to put it mildly. Uh, 
but why I was particularly disturbed about my own fellow countrymen. Uh, the London liberals who rushed to attack, rushed his right to publish whatever he chose, something that I agree with, but combining this, segueing immediately uh, into an out-and-out -out denunciation of Islam as a violent, bloodthirsty religion. And indeed, Rushdie's book is deliberately drawing on this ancient, medieval, Christian, Western stereotype, if you think about it. The prophet as a chauvinist, for example. Uh, the prophet uh, as, um, as, as, a, as, a, as a, a lecture. The prophet as a charlatan. The prophet as cruel, etc. Now, um, I remember pacing up and down my living room uh, in a rage with the Sunday papers around me, looking at these self-righteous, pompous uh, articles by leading intellectuals denigrating Islam. And I had a sinking feeling of dread that we had learned nothing since the 1930s and 40s. We haven't learned the lessons uh, of where that kind of cultivated bigotry can lead to. And that's when I decided to write my biography of the Prophet Muhammad, because it, I kept on saying to myself, the trouble is there's no Western accessible uh, biography that Western people can understand and appreciate about, about the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and then I, the horrible thought occurred to me that perhaps I should do this book. And I have to say, it was not a popular idea with my publishers who all thought that the Muslims would be out to get me and I would find myself in hiding with Salman Rushdie. Um, that didn't happen. Um, I got a, quite a critical response from my fellow countrymen, but to my astonishment, something I hadn't looked for at that very uh, difficult time, a wonderfully warm response from the Muslim communities in both uh, the United Kingdom and the United States. Um, and I thought, again, how generous. People, all my friends had said, they won't like it, you know. Uh, not only a Western person, but a Western woman writing about their prophet. Uh, but there was, uh, again, that spirit of outreach uh, that, we, that God is of the, neither of the East nor the West. So um, a lot of our problems have car these medieval problems, as we see, carry with us into modernity. And with that rushy crisis, you have a clash, a clash. Uh, between two systems of value. One that regards uh, the modern uh, value of free speech, whatever happens, as absolutely sacred and unnegotiable, and so central to uh, the personality and identity uh, that, they, that it cannot be infringed in any way. Uh, on the other hand, you've got people who say, no, the sovereignty of God is more important than free speech. You've got a clash of two competing conceptions of what is sacred. And we should be grown up about this. These clashes are likely to happen as people achieve uh, greater stages of modernization, or some might say they don't want to be modernized at all, and I can understand why. Though I must say that I am very thankful to be a modern Western woman in many ways. I can imagine no other period of history when as a woman I would have felt remotely comfortable. In the Middle Ages I would probably have been burned as a witch, I should think. Um, but I've had a very privileged life. I've never been seriously hungry. I've never feared a knock on the door. I was educated free of charge at one of the greatest universities in the world. I've had a charmed life. It's not been without its problems, but it's been a charmed life. I'm in a tiny minority. And for some people, as I shall explain, uh, modernity has been experienced not as something liberating and empowering, but as subjugating uh, and as even humiliating. Um, so what is it about modernity? What is modernity? It's always sort of touted around this term. Uh, I'll be technical for a few moments. Uh, it is based not so much on ideas or culture, but on a basic economic shift. During the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, the Western Europe and later the colonies that would become the United States 
began to uh, build an entirely new kind of civilization, one that had no precedent in world history. Instead of being based, uh, like all the previous civilizations, on um, a surplus of agricultural produce, you grew more crops than you needed, etc., then you could trade with these and fund your civilizing enterprises. Uh, this new economy, developed in the West by fits and starts, was built on technology and a scientific replication of resources and the constant reinvestment of capital. And this, for at least for, the ti for that time being, gave Europe uh, a much greater freedom. Uh, until that time, uh, it wasn't that uh, non-modern people were inherently timid or conservative, but you couldn't afford to fund uh, many projects uh, that were going to uh, go, that you couldn't you, so you couldn't implement them, you couldn't encourage people to have new ideas about society or new inventions, because you, in all likelihood, they, they couldn't come to fruition. People, society just hadn't got the resources for it. Nowadays, when a new computer is invented, we just chuck the old ones out and the office changes overnight. No society before uh, our modernity could afford this complete uh, change of the infrastructure. And that demanded, uh, the Europeans discovered, that the whole of life had to change. Not just uh, economics, it affected politics, it affected social life. And new values started to come to the fore in order to make these, uh, these countries, these modernizing countries, productive. One of these values was democracy. Uh, democracy had been around as a sort of vague idea in Greece, for example, but uh, nobody would, could, could possibly implement uh, Athenian democracy uh, today. Uh, it would be most undesirable to do so. Um, but in the modern period, it was found that more and more people had to be brought into the productive process, even at a humble level, as printers or office clerks or factory workers. And that meant that they had to receive a modicum of education. And the more educated they became, the more inevitably they began to demand a share in the gov governing decisions of their country. More, uh, it, it wasn't that we developed this idea because we're such frightfully nice people that we wanted to let the lower orders have a share in their government. Uh, we, we, these rights had to be fought for, and it wasn't until the 1930s in, a, in places like Britain or the United States that women were fully uh, enfranchised. We, everybody had to fight for their right to get the vote, etc. Uh, and it was found that those countries that democratized went ahead while those countries that tried to hog the benefits and riches of modernity and confine them to a small elite uh, fell behind. So democracy became one of the uh, idea, part of the modernizing process. At a certain stage of industrialization, it became the only way to have a really productive state. Similarly, uh, we, it, it had to be tolerant. That meant that people who had traditionally been uh, on the outskirts of society, like uh, the Jews in Europe or the Roman Catholics in Britain, uh, were, had to be brought into the mainstream uh, so that the, the country could use all the human resources at, their, at its disposal in order to keep productive. And, um, but we saw in the 1930s, to our shame, how superficial that uh, tolerance was. Uh, the old hatred and bigotry was still there. Um, but uh, a secular too. Uh, we, it was found unproductive uh, to have an established church that could dictate policy and perhaps get in the way of productivity. Now, um, every modern society has to have two characteristics, two qualities. And if you don't have these, no matter how many um, skyscrapers or computers or fighter jets you have, you don't have a fully modernized society. The first one of these is independence. Um, modern, modernization in Europe and the United States developed 
by a constant uh, declarations of independence on all fronts. Religious, Luther declares independence of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, intellectual, the intellectuals demanded the freedom to think and invent as they chose without being hampered by the established church. Uh, the Declaration of Independence in the United States, a typical modernizing document. Freedom was the watchword. The other one, the other quality is innovation. We were always in the West doing something new, pitting ourselves against unprecedented challenges, at finding entirely novel solutions. And so even though modernization was very traumatic, as I'll say, show, it was still exciting. There was a dynamism about it. Now, in some of the Muslim countries, uh, the new modern economy didn't come with independence, uh, but with colonial subjugation. It didn't come with freedom. And it didn't come with innovation, because we were so far ahead uh, that you uh, could only copy us. So instead of independence, you have dependence. And instead of uh, um, innovation, you have imitation. And that means that, that, that it's harder work to modernize. Plus, uh, you've had less time to do it. We had three or four hundred years to modernize. And the ideas had time to trickle down to every level of society, naturally. Uh, but modernization had to be achieved very, very quickly with all kinds of social um, uh, difficulties and political difficulties in the wake of that. It's rather like baking a cake. Uh, if you, you, got, you get the recipe book and you may not have um, proper flour but only, say, ground rice, or you may not have fresh eggs but only powdered eggs, or you may not have a proper oven, and if you don't have the right implements and the right ingredients, you're not likely to get the fluffy cake that in, that's pictured in the cookbook. What you could get could be nasty. And in some of these countries, the wrong kind of ingredients have been going in to the cake of modernity. Especially, and colonization uh, was particularly uh, difficult. Two points. Modernization is always a violent period. It, the, these centuries, 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, were in a sense catastrophic in Europe. There were bloody revolutions, succeeded by reigns of terror, succeeded by dictatorships, as people strove to inculcate a more democratic style of society. We beheaded our king, a uh, great national trauma in England. French Revolution, Reign of Terror. Dictatorships followed. Uh, there were terrible wars of religion in which religion was, got a bad name. And much of the aversion that you see in the uh, European Enlightenment of the 18th century springs from these terrible wars of religion which left in Central Europe 35% of the population dead th over 30 years. Uh, all these growing pains. Uh, you have the exploitation of women and children in the factories. Uh, you had anomie and, uh, in the, and, and distress and malaise in the, in, the, in the newly industrializing cities in the slums. Uh, it was traumatic. And uh, what are we seeing today in some parts of the modernizing world, but bloody revolutions, reigns of terror, dictatorships, wars of religion. And we in the West have forgotten what we went through. We've come out the other side and think we've always been in the vanguard of pro progress. Not at all. Um, secondly, our modernity has been violent. Um, Amir, I mean, uh, listed the horrifying number of people who died uh, in the last century as resu a result of ar armed conflict. In Europe alone, between 1914 and 1945, 70 million people died in Europe as a result of war. Um, and uh, there is a violence about society, and there has always been people who've lost out. If you, th it's the Jewish people, 
for example, one of the first people to lose to modernity. The Spanish Inquisition was a modernizing institution uh, that uh, was trying to make a single kingdom uh, and a single centralized state, a sine qua non of modernity, out of the different Iberian Spanish kingdoms. Um, and the Jews were the principal culprits, but there were also um, the Native Americans, the people who were colonized, as here in the, uh, in, in the subcontinent, um, and the Africans who were enslaved. I, when, when I was with the United Nations in Senegal a couple of years ago, we were taken to see the slave house on one of the islands just off the coast of Senegal, where the slaves were kept before they were shipped to Europe and the United, and the United States. And there was, a, rooms were very small. There was, and, and, and people were herded into them, sometimes for months at a time before they were put on a ship. There, were, there was a room for um, men, separate room for women, a separate room for young women for obvious nefarious reasons, and a separate room for the children. So the parents had to listen to their children crying uh, just across the hall, as it were. Now, what struck me, it was, a, it was a terrible place full of sadness, and just one of the many such slave houses that had been built at that time, but this was the show, show one. And it was uh, built in the same year as the American Declaration of Independence. So modernity could mean freedom for some and enslavement and suffering for others. And there is therefore an inherent violence in, in, in modernity as it declares itself. And that has made the whole of life violent, more violent than it was. Uh, we're always talking about how violent the Muslim world is, but you know, I mean, the United States with its gun crime and terrible shootings in schools. In England, recently, in the last few months, almost every night we have an account of young people uh, stabbing one another on our streets. There is violence. Football in my country, I've never been, I have to say, to a football match in my life, but uh, it used to be a nice, pleasant game where uh, fathers would take their children in the afternoon. Now it's potentially dangerous and there can be riots as we've seen on the television and killing. I mean, a little while ago, you'll remember this, because I think it was connected with your cricket team. There was a suspicion that, uh, some, some, uh, that the coach had been killed because of a cricket match. I think it came to nothing in the end. The man had actually died of natural causes. But the fact, thank you, the fact that we should even think such a thing uh, shows how violence has infiltrated many aspects of life. And we shouldn't be surprised, therefore, that religion has also become more aggressive in, um, as part of our modernity. Now, I, yeah. So, what do we do about this? Um, I was at a conference in Istanbul um, last December, in December, where hundreds of us, it seemed, came onto the platform and talked about Islamophobia, but it seemed to be a waste because nothing was done about it. I think at the end of such a conference, you need uh, things to be drawn together. You need to make some resolutions. You need to take a step forward. And I think that uh, it's now time uh, to think positively of how we can get out of this. Now, uh, Europeans have got a job to do. We pride ourselves on the liberal nature of our culture, and yet we don't seem to see this uh, bigotry that, that, I'm, that I'm sorry to say is part and parcel of our life. And this is my jihad, uh, to change my people. I'm not here to change you, but I'm trying to change my own people's perspective on what is going on. Uh, I'm using the word jihad, of course, in its original sense uh, of um, a struggle, an effort, an endeavor. Um, now, there is, I think, a real need now 
for the world to see Islam as it is. Um, what grab the headlines are uh, the extremists, extremist forms of Islam, uh, extremist forms of religion generally. Uh, there's extremist forms of Christianity, extremist forms of Judaism, and extremist forms of Buddhism, for example, or Confucianism, though we don't hear so much about them as we hear about Islam. Uh, so we, we really do have a, a, a jihad on our hands. What happens in these conflicts, think of the Danish cartoons, is that uh, it's fueled on both sides by extremists. There are, if I may call them so, the secular fundamentalists on the one side, the free speech uh, extremists, who say free speech at any cost, regardless of people's sensibilities, uh, and down uh, in your face free speech. So those cartoons have to be uh, published again and again and again. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you have uh, these uh, mi minority of Muslims who pull down embassies and, uh, and attack people on the streets and walk around with placards saying, we'll crucify the extremists. In the middle, there's a whole range of opinion. Gallup did a poll at the time of the Danish cartoon crisis in Denmark, first of all, and found that the majority of Danish people, while in fully uh, desirous of free speech for all, were very upset that these cartoons had caused such offense and disturbance throughout the world. On the other hand, nine, the Muslim youth uh, in various countries interviewed by Gallup, 97% said that they were offended by the cartoons, but they were also uh, not approving of the violent methods of some of the protesters. So, but that voice of the majority doesn't get heard. And I think we need now to develop quite consciously counter-narratives, uh, stories that counter, the, that go against, or put an alternative to the story that is being told in newspapers about Islam and about religion generally. In my country, in Britain, it's so secular now that religion itself is regarded as detrimental. Only 6% of the British population attend a religious service regularly. Uh, and I wouldn't mind betting that a large proportion of that 6% are Muslims who have bumped up our national average considerably. Now, the great task of our time whether we are religious or secular, is to build a global community, to build a world that's safe for the next generation, where we can get on with one another in a more mature and compassionate way than we've been achieving up until now. And I think no matter how sound or orthodox or any ideology is, if it leads to more dissension and more hatred, then I think it's doing a disservice. This is one of my complaints. I'm writing a book at the moment about the new atheism. You may have heard about uh, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, people, the new wave of militant atheism that is developing in parts of the West. And my uh, quarrel with these people, I don't like to use the word quarrel, because again, that is inflammatory language, uh, is that they're so unpleasant about it. By all means, voice your criticisms of religion, but in an attempt to stir up more divisions, um, then, uh, you know, this, this, is, this is not helpful. And similarly, any form of religious uh, ideology or spirituality that leads to a closing of doors and an exclusion of the other uh, sh is not meeting the needs of our time, uh, the, the jihad we need. Now, Muslims have a head start of over certainly Jews and Christians in this respect because of that pluralism in the Quran that you have written there, enshrined in it. Um, 
not just a toleration, I would like to expunge the word toleration or even tolerance, though that's the title of one of my lectures tomorrow. Um, I'd rather we went for appreciation. We are living in a time when for the first time in history we really have a chance to understand the nature of one another's faith. And we can see the profound similarities, uh, the profound unanimity in the religious quest of humanity. And the Quran sees this. All rightly guided religion comes from God. Uh, you cannot be a Muslim unless you also uh, affirm the prophecy of Jesus, Moses, Abraham, the great prophets of the past. Uh, the story of the prophet's mirage, his ascension to the throne of God, uh, has become the paradigm of Muslim spirituality. We all have to make such an ascent to the divine back to the source of our being in, in, in the, at the divine throne. Uh, but it's a story of pluralism. When the, it, you see the prophet journeying from Mecca to Jerusalem into the heart of the monotheistic family, reflecting his yearning to bring the Arabs, who at this time felt left off the map of salvation, right into the heart of the older traditions on the Temple Mount. Um, and there the prophet is greeted by all the prophets of the past uh, who don't say, who on earth do you think you are, you upstart, um, daring to claim prophecy. The prophecy is closed now. Uh, they ask him to preach. And of course, on the uh, Haram al-Sharif, there's the pulpit which symbolizes the place where the prophet um, gave his preaching. Then he and Gabriel started ascending through the seven heavens in the same way as many of the Jewish mystics at that time. Uh, and at each, in each of the heavens, he encountered the great prophets of the past, Adam, uh, Moses, John the Baptist, uh, Aaron, uh, and at the threshold of the divine sphere, the beloved Abraham, uh, the father of all who have faith. And uh, at one, in one of the versions, uh, the prophet asks Muhammad, uh, Moses how many times uh, Muslims should pray. He's thinking of 10 times a day. And Moses says, don't even go there. Don't even think about it. Be realistic, for heaven's sake. Um, and whittles it down until eventually Muhammad comes out with five. And Moses still thinks that's too much and would like to send him back in to ask for just to whittle the number down to three times. What this shows is uh, that the prophets are willing to listen to one another, to learn from one another, to share their perplexities, share their insights. And that story is written deeply into the paradigm, as I say, of Muslim spirituality. And we have the great example of the uh, the way people um, d behave politically in the past. Now, I hope some, not, none of you are coming to the lecture tomorrow because I'll be telling a couple of these stories again. Uh, but they can't be, they, ca they bear telling again in this time when we're always hearing how violent Islam is. Um, when uh, Omar uh, conquered the city of Jerusalem, in 638. He was escorted around the uh, city by the Greek Orthodox Patriarch, as he were, hand, who handed over the keys to him. And while uh, they were in the, ho the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, as it's called now, um, the Patriarch, it was time for Muslim prayer. And the Patriarch invited Omar to pray right there beside the tomb of Christ. Omar declined and went outside to pray in the main street of Jerusalem. He said, if I had prayed here, some misguided Muslims would have had the idea of uh, converting this church into a mosque in order to celebrate the first Muslim prayer 
in Jerusalem. And that mustn't happen. And he signed an edict decreeing that all the Christians must keep their churches intact in the best part of town. Um, and sure enough, if you've been uh, to Jerusalem, uh, you will see right opposite the Holy Sepulchre Church, there is a little mosque of Omar uh, opposite, the mosque of Omar, which celebrates uh, the first prayer in Jerusalem, but it's opposite the Holy Sepulchre Church. Then uh, the Quran, of course, talks about the great mosque that, that Solomon, the prophet Solomon, had built in Jerusalem. And so uh, they said, where is the temple? Where is it? And the Christians suddenly started to get a bit uh, edgy because ever since the Jewish temple had been burned down by the Romans in 70 of the Common Era, uh, it had be, the ruins had been left as it was. The whole place had been left a terrible ruin uh, as, a, as a symbol of Christianity's subjugation of Judaism. The Christians could look down on this ruined Temple Mount with its charred buildings, uh, charred old ruins. Uh, and, it, and they used to go up there and meditate on the fact that the Christianity had defeated Judaism. Not nice. Uh, and in recent years, the Byzantines had taken to using this as the city garbage dump. And eventually, they have to come clean, and they escort the caliph to the Temple Mount. And he looks around in horror and immediately starts clearing the site, dousing the stones with rose water. And not only that, but invites the Jews who had never been allowed to reside permanently in Jerusalem. Uh, to come back and live in the city. Um, and 70 families, Jewish families from Tiberias, uh, came and settled in Jerusalem, and they lived side by side uh, next to the Muslims in the hotter part of town, right under what's now the Haram al-Sharif. put it out of reach. And uh, in the 7th century, uh, some Jews wrote that the uh, Muslims in reconsecrating the holy places were the precursors of the Messiah uh, because they had made, cleared the way for their Messiah to come. So there was pluralism in the past. Think of the Sufis uh, who uh, in ecstasy, quite commonly cried that they're neither Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. They're at home equally in a synagogue, a mosque, a temple, or a church. Because once a man or woman of God has glimpsed the divine, these man-made distinctions uh, just fall by the wayside. And Sufi spirituality, not many of us could actually be mystics, but Sufi spirituality was for many years the chief mode of Islamic uh, expression. Then, um, this, you, these are difficult times. This is my next point, of where you have a fabulous tradition that will help you in the present disaster. These are difficult times, and we all know how it is when you feel under attack, how it, you become defensive, uh, how easy and how difficult it is to be creative uh, because one's always you're always on the defensive but creativity is what is needed and in the past that is what Muslims were able to do spectacularly Muslims uh, listened from a very early date to history if you think of the year, terrible years following the Prophet's death when there were these wars uh, the fitna, the first two fitnas, the, the trial, the temptation, uh, where you have uh, the death of, uh, the murder of Ali, the murder of Uthman, the murder of Hussein, uh, the Prophet's companions at odds with one another. Uh, a terrible time. And you could excuse people from saying, this, this is Islam, but no, the Muslims looked at this disaster self-critically. And a group of them, an elite creative group, began to develop all the great intellectual and spiritual traditions that would characterize mature Islam. 
uh, Sufism sprang out uh, of this, uh, an aversion from the new uh, uh, luxury of the caliphal courts um, and a desire for a more ascetic, pure way of life. It's thought that the word Tawasasuf uh, referred to the woolen, plain woolen robe, just as the, as the prophet had worn, not all these silks and fineries that you had in the, in the aristocratic court. Uh, it, Muslim history uh, began when people said, how do we know, what, what would the prophet have done? And they started collecting uh, hadith, reports about the prophet's life and his sayings. And uh, a massed Muslim historiography began with that attempt to bring some kind of or Muslim order back. Sharia law developed, started to develop at this time as a counterbalance to the luxury of the court and the inequality of, of some of aspects of the caliphal court. Um, and the Shia uh, developed at this time with its passion for social justice, uh, something that was felt that was not being observed in the mainstream. And from this catastrophe of these early political upheavals, something wonderful appeared. Islam was spoken anew, applied to new situations so that Muslims could go on, even in the depths of un discomfort, unhappiness, uh, and dis-ease. And another occasion is after the Mongol invasions of the 14th century, when Mongols uh, rampaged through Muslim countries, destroying whole libraries, whole cities, massacring whole populations, until they were finally turned back uh, by the Berbers. And um, the, then, of course, the Mongols converted to Islam. And instead of just lamenting uh, the, the, the catastrophe of, of, this, of this invasion, uh, the Muslims created new empires. They learned from the Mongols. Uh, they created new empires, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Safavid Empire, the Mongol or Mughal Empire uh, in the subcontinent. Uh, which took many aspects of Mongol life and Islamized them. And these were the most up-to-date states in the world at that time. Um, and there was also, of course, a great spiritual revival. A Rumi was uh, a refugee from the Mongols. Um, so again, after a disaster, uh, a, a not just a reeling back, but a positive creativity. Uh, now almost is the time to be religious. Now is when there's a new fitna, as it were, a new trial. Now is the time to exercise uh, creativity. And always, uh, Muslims had a real genius for going in melding with other civilizations. If you think of the uh, first Arab armies coming out of Arabia, um, rough, uh, used to a very rough, uh, impoverished society, encountering uh, the sophisticated worlds of Persia and Byzantium, and able to adapt, to take the very best of those cultures, Islamize them, in a great creative burst, bring uh, to fight, because uh, Islam is at home anywhere in the world where there is excellence and where there's willingness to surrender one's being to the divine. And that is in your tradition. I think of uh, the way the Muslim thinkers were always uh, so innovative. Uh, look at Al Ghazali, for example who, in his search for certainty, looked at all the ideologies of his time, even those that he didn't agree with, to find light. The great philosophers, uh, the great philosophers who encountered uh, the philosophy of pay, uh, and science of the ancient Greeks um, and uh, Islamized them. They didn't say, this is pagan rubbish, we don't want anything to do with it, but again, Islamized it, said, you know, embraced it. 
Um, and that, that was, that again is that part of that all-inclusive spirit that is endemic to Islam. Uh, and it's what we need now. The West, as I say, has its jihad. The West has to deal with its, uh, with its bigotry, with its, uh, and, and indeed Western people are often, I think of the Dutch, and I, the Dutch are in my mind because of this awful film that is uh, coming out shortly, uh, which uh, is, is going to be very offensive, I think. And there is gr the Dutch, who are so sort of liberal in many ways, are, I've been f noticing it when I go and visit that country, are all so bewildered by their illiberality over, over this Islamic business. But that's not the whole of the Dutch people. Uh, uh, later this year, the Dutch um, government is giving me a medal uh, for my work uh, with uh, on, on educating about Islam. So it's a reflection that this is not the whole of what Dutch people are. We mustn't uh, just keep on presenting the worst of ourselves to one another and thinking that the extremists represent the whole. Um, so basically, um, I'd like uh, to, 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 to finish now. I'm going to test your tolerance. Uh, as I realize this is Pakistan, and I'm going to end with a quotation from Gandhi. So just bear with me. Um, and someone gave me this uh, maxim of Gandhi's on a, on a badge, you know, one of those badges, and I liked it so much that I pinned it to my uh, curtain, bedroom window, the curtain in my bedroom, so that I have to look at it every time I draw the curtain on to start a new day. And it says this, you must yourself be the change that you wish to see in the world. And this is something that we can all do. We, ha you ha we have our traditions to draw upon which speak of the importance of tolerance and absolute respect for the sacred rights of others. So do you. And you have a, a richness of tradition to draw upon, of openness, of creativity, of appreciation of other cultures, uh, which in the past has enabled Muslims to come out of really difficult and dark corners. And you've done this before, and you can do it again, inshallah. Thank you very much. Dr. Armstrong, you made a very interesting uh, speech. Uh, may I just ask you, the, from Mauritania to Indonesia, the Islamic world is very inflamed for the reasons you have. Maybe mainly because of the political uh, uh, reasons. But you know, the unfortunate thing is that in the Islamic world also, we have huge problems. There is a divide between the elite and the masses. Now, what I notice is that the dialogue that is going on between the Islamic world and the West is virtually among, between, the, between the elites. There is no communication between the masses in the Islamic world and the masses in the West. Oh. What would be the common message that you would have for the, for the masses on both sides? Because unless oh, they come to terms, I think this divide is going to get worse. Um, I, think this is, I think this is a very, very good question. You're right that elites are the ones uh, who talk to one another. Um, and very often what you see from the masses are these uh, mass risings uh, with it badly thought out Islam, that kind of thing. Uh, but, and uh, it's similarly true in Britain. I mean, Tony, war Tony Blair went to war with Iraq against the wishes of the express majority, the masses of the people, in a war for democracy. Uh, so there, there is this problem. And what I would like to see, I, I don't, I would, there, there are things that can link the masses together. There's, we have all kinds of communications now. We have internet. We have, I think we need to help to mobilize the voices of ordinary people. There, I mean, I'm part of the masses. Uh, 
all these intelligent people, many of you, I'm sure, are not part of the masses, are very elite, but there are a lot of you who are. We could get our, we need to organize, we need to have a movement, like as in the 1960s, whereby we come together. That was what the Alliance of Civilizations was trying to do. I think, however, that while there are outstanding political problems like Israel-Palestine, which go on inflaming both masses and elites alike on all sides of the divide, I think <laughs> solutions are difficult. But I would like to see more um, reaching out to ordinary people and getting that voice heard. That's what democracy means. Um, and uh, we need to educate our children and educate ourselves about the other educate our children and educate ourselves about other people's religious faith, about the history of other parts of the world, about other people's problems. Uh, ignorance is largely what, 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 what we're up against. Um, and that needs another, another huge jihad. Education, I think, is a massive key, uh, not just of children, but of the, of, of the ordinary populace so that there's, there is a, a groundswell of uh, feeling uh, that politicians would have to take notice of. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. You had said that, you had said that uh, for modernity, you need innovation, freedom, and independence. And those are not visible in the Islamic world. Would you connect that to the closing down of ijtihad? Uh, I wouldn't say that there's no independence or freedom in the in Muslim world, no, but that it has been more difficultly acquired uh, because of the process of colonialism. That countries such as Japan, for example, so, which were not colonized, not subject to foreign influence, had a rocky ride to modernity, like as, as, as Europe did, but was able to be more creative. Uh, the colonial uh, occupation, perhaps you would agree, might agree or disagree, uh, certainly helped to stymie uh, the development of freedom here. Yeah. No, uh, the closing down of Ishtihad was one of the uh, responses uh, to the Mongol invasions, actually, one of the less creative, uh, let's preserve what we have. But it was never really observed by the, by, I believe the Shia, for example, have never really accepted the closing of the gates of Ishtiha. Uh, and um, I think what's happened though, and something I didn't say, is that one of the things that the West is, is dogmatic. We're very dogmatic. And that we have a sort of idolatry of opinion. And this, uh, the literalism, uh, it's our scientific bias that makes us now read text in an entirely literal way, in a way that we didn't do before. And this is spreading. As modernization and as scientism, uh, this kind of literal-minded approach is spreading. Uh, and also, as people feel under attack, they're going to cl often cling to orthodoxy and not want to move. Um, I think uh, that uh, change is always painful, even when you're not under attack in any way. Change is always, because you, in change you're facing the unknown. But it's like the Hijra, uh, when the Prophet left Mecca and uh, attempted the unthought of, in, uh, inconceivable it was, to leave your tribe and take up permanent residence with another. It was absolutely unthinkable. And that he did and, and brought life. And it is a, a paradigm for us all that re religion has to move on. I don't think it's just the closing of the gates of Ishtiha, but I think uh, it, uh, it, it's far more of a pervasive uh, orthodoxy, which we're getting in other, it's not just Muslims who are doing this. No cl closing of the gates of Ishtiha in uh, Christianity, uh, but a whole lot of Christians are becoming uh, highly more orthodox uh, and, and conservative and unwilling uh, to shift, spending a lot of time arguing about complete inessentials of minutiae of Christian doctrine or uh, morality, uh, and neglecting uh, the prime duty of compassion and respect and, uh, that, that is what the world cries for in religion at this time. Thank you. Uh, Jabbar Saab, and then we take Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Here.
Armstrong, my compliments on a very lucid and panoramic survey. Uh, I must have missed the first few minutes, so pardon my ignorance or my misunderstanding, but in the part that I was privileged to hear, you made an observation to the effect that we will have to make a choice of being either secular or religious. I may have misunderstood it, but to my humble mind, that is the true clash. The complete misrepresentation of what secularism means and to set it up as an antithesis to religion. Whereas Islam, in my limited understanding, is inherently a secular religion. So I would only urge you, if you have used that concept of juxtaposing the two as antithesis of each other, to hopefully consider revising that formulation and to stressing the secularism of Islam. Thank One would you. benefit by your observation. Thank you. Um, I didn't say, I, I don't think that uh, secular, we had a choice between secularism and uh, religion. I think the words that perhaps haplessly crossed my lips were that our task today, whether our ideology be secular or religious, uh, is to build a global civilization. No, and I would agree with you uh, that uh, secularism uh, ha is becoming, um, however, a sort of religiosity in countries like Britain. Um, and in the United States, I say to the Americans, would you please stop banging on about the separation of church and state? Um, I said, you know, we, you, they're always looking at us with sorrow, for example, because we've got uh, an established Church of England, uh, whereas most British people would find the idea that the sleepy Church of England is in any way infringing their rights quite ludicrous. Um, the, and I said, what we don't have in, uh, in Britain, uh, with our established church and bishops in the House of Lords, we don't have people banging up uh, the Ten Commandments on law on on on, on, on courthouses, uh, or demanding that evolution be not taught in the public schools. We don't have that, um, and I think that if you if you keep going on about secularism, then you create exactly the scenario, sir, that you are thinking of seeing the two as antithetical. Uh, secularism means uh, the world. Islam is a religion of the world, uh, and we all have to live in the world. That was one of the insights of the Protestant Reformation, out of the monastery, back into the world. And the prophet, when he comes down from the throne of God, has to go back to Mecca, uh, the mess, and to sort things out. Or, uh, as the Buddha says, after enlightenment, back to the marketplace, and there practice compassion for all living beings. So I uh, know I don't uh, polarize the secular and the religious. I deplore this uh, arrogance. We are, se secularism is evil on the one hand and uh, the religious idea that, uh, that the, the secular idea that only a wholly secular society with no religion uh, is allowed to pop its head out of the private sphere uh, is, uh, is viable. These, these are both extreme, one quite could call them fundamentalist positions. Um, and I would agree with you at the back. I'm glad you got your voice and rights at the back there. Turkey is a most modern country, you know, and it is a secular country as well, but it is trying for the last decades, two or three decades, to become a member of the European community. But there is strong opposition from the European country as a whole, particularly the major members of the community. And as a result, the European community looks like a Christian club, more than a, than a universal or a regional a group of countries. What do you think is the root cause of the opposition to, the, to, to Turkey to become the regular member of the European community? Uh, let me say once again, bleat once again and for all, I did not say that Europe was more liberal. Uh, than anybody else. Uh, you know, this I would like to be on the record. And as I, I know it, I'm constantly dealing with this. This problem of Turkey, for example, I would love to see Turkey in the European Union. I think it would send such a beacon and a message to the rest of the world. Uh, and um, I, think, I think it's an exciting and invigorating thought. 
but you're right, there are a lot of illiberal people, and I said at the beginning of my talk, we have always been intolerant. From the time of the Crusades, unfortunately, Europeans have found it difficult to live side by side with people of other religious traditions. Uh, we proved that at the time of the Crusades. It went on so that we couldn't even live beside other Christians. And so you have Catholics and Protestants killing one another in the name of religion. Now, uh, and that, that essential illiberalism is there. And that's why I was so disturbed by the Salman Rushdie crisis, because that old bigotry was coming out of the, uh, out of the closet again. And I heard it, I was at a NATO conference. Uh, giving a teaching day there uh, on fundamentalism. And they were, these were the top brass from NATO, from all the NATO countries. And a German got up and said about the Turks, Turkish migrant workers in his uh, country, that they don't, he said, uh, go to I German places of uh, uh, entertainment. They don't go to German restaurants, they have their own restaurants, their own place, they are not assimilating. And I said, they remind me, that reminds me of the British Raj or the, uh, the British uh, in Egypt. They didn't pop into the local Egyptian and Indian restaurants either. They went to their own club. People do congregate together. Uh, and I said, you, we don't want to see these people, he said. We don't want to see them in their hijab. I say, you cannot, especially you from Germany, but no European can ever again, in however symbolic or indirect way, say that we want people to disappear. We can never do that again. We are like, in Europe, far from being liberal, uh, we are like recovering alcoholics who can't allow ourselves a single sip of this noxious liquor of intolerance. Um, a Dutch person got up, a Dutch naval officer got up and said, uh, you know, this is our country, our culture, and they are changing it. I said, cultures change. It will change. But now you are beginning to understand in a tiny, tiny little way what it was like when we, and you were, Dutch were a colonizing power, went into these countries with power and changed them forever. Your, your experience, a tiny little pinprick of that. Now use that dis-ease you had to understand what has happened in our former colonies. Colonization doesn't go away when the colonists come home. It, it goes on and on. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so far from being uh, singing the praises of liberal Europe, I fear for Europe, and I fear that if we don't, uh, and it's not a Christian club, believe me, most of these people are rabid secularists who want nothing to do with Christianity, uh, who see Christianity as something that should be abolished, basically, or else regarded with disdain. It's a new intolerance. Uh, so, uh, so. I fear for Europe, much as I love it, and I am a European, and I love my country, and when I go home on uh, Tuesday, I can't wait to dip down underneath the cloud cover that covers that damp island and see London underneath. I get a glow of delight at coming home, but I realize we have problems and a difficult past, and that sadly, we have added to the suffering of the world. Thank you. Thank you.